All right, time for the probability video I should have made originally. Years later, and I still don't see much of a direct application of probability for game dev, other than just generating a random float between zero and one and doing something with that. If we look back at the algebra video, that's essentially what we did to create the spread on the quote unquote shotgun we quote unquote designed. But hopefully I have enough of your trust or I've gaslit you into liking math enough to just launch launch into a probability video raw without any concrete game dev example. Maybe if you want to create a real 500 IQ AI system, you'd use Monte Carlo tree search or Bayesian game theory decision making. But if you're implementing those systems, this video is not going to be anything novel. So while this may be in the quote math for game dev playlist, that's in name only. As is now channel tradition, we'll proceed at breakneck pace through basically a probability 101 course. But before that, I'm just going to assume that all random events have fair outcomes unless otherwise stated, i.e. if we flip a coin, both heads and tails are equally likely. There's been a lot of ink spilled in probability texts and problems that the random event being considered are fair, but I'm too lazy for that level of rigorous mathematical clarity. Probability differs from statistics in that statistics is retrospective with actual data, which is cringe, whereas probability is prospective without any data. Probability considers the possible outcomes of random events, coin flips, dice rolls, etc., and it allows us to formally reason about them. We call the random events being considered random variables, or RVs for short. To differentiate random variables from algebraic variables, we typically write them out using capital letters. RVs come in two flavors, discrete random variables with a finite number of outcomes, and continuous random variables with an infinite number of outcomes. Probability distributions map outcomes of random variables to percentage likelihoods of said outcome. Two properties that are basically corollaries of this definition is that the combined sum of the likelihood of all outcomes is of course equal to one, and the probability of an outcome not happening is one minus the probability of it happening. For discrete RVs, we use the sigma sum, and for continuous RVs, we use integrals. If two or more random variables are independent, we add the likelihoods of certain events occurring together. So for example, if I have a coin and a six-sided die, the likelihood of me flipping a heads or rolling a six is the likelihood of me flipping a heads plus the likelihood of me rolling a six. Whereas if two or more random variables are dependent, we multiply their likelihoods together instead. So if I roll two six-sided dice, the likelihood of me rolling a 12 is the likelihood of me rolling a six on both dice, which means I would multiply those two values together to get the likelihood of me rolling a 12. So let's consider a single coin flip. We know the probability of heads is 0.5 and tails is also 0.5, and that's its probability distribution. We can of course graph it out if we let the outcome of tails be 0 and the outcome of heads be 1, but it's not very exciting. For a little more excitement, however, we can consider multiple coin flips. Let's go with 5. We know that while unlikely, we could get tails for all flips, i.e. 0, with a probability of 0.5 raised to the fifth and equally unlikely, we could get heads for all flips, i.e. five, with the same probability of 0.5 raised to the fifth. And we can naturally intuit that the middling outcomes are more likely, but to actually calculate the other values, let's consider the outcome of two heads out of a total of five flips, which is to say the probability of two. And this is where we have to turn to combinatorics. We already know that the probability of two heads and three tails is going to just be the probability of heads squared times the probability of tails cubed, which is 0.5 raised to the fifth. But now we need to know how many total combinations of two heads out of a total five flips there are. I haven't done and probably won't do a combinatorics video, so I'm just going to formula ex machina this bit, but this is where we use the formula of NCR to calculate the total number of combinations of choosing two out of a total of five. NCR is written as N over R in parens and is defined as N factorial divided by R factorial times N minus R factorial. So 
we find that the probability of 2 is equal to 5 choose 2 times 0 0.5 raised to the fifth. And with this, we can not only calculate and graph the other values, but also generalize it to n finite fair or even unfair coin flips. This is the binomial distribution. If you go onto Wikipedia, you can search up a bunch of other probability distributions and see what they're typically used to model. If we compare the binomial distribution to the normal distribution, we can see that they look kind of similar, with the normal distribution being the continuous counterpart to the binomial distribution. But what if we actually did flip a coin five times? What value would we expect to get? Obviously, we can look at it and see that, well, looks like we expect to get either a two or a three, but using the probability distribution, we can rigorously define our expected value as the following. As you can see, this is just a weighted average of all outcomes, and it basically matches up with our visual intuition. The expected value of 5 coin flips is 2.5, and for continuous RVs, we use integrals instead of sums. And since the expected value is just a weighted average, we get these nice properties. However, expected values alone can leave out a lot of the picture for random variables. Compare our five coin flips to rolling a six-sided die labeled 0 through 5. Of course, both will have an expected value of 2.5, but the dice roll varies a lot more than our coin flips. We can use variance, or how much we expect the outcomes to differ from the expected value, to quantify that. Variance is defined as the following. And before you start panicking, wondering how to calculate this, it's just a paper tiger. Keep in mind that the expected value of x is just a constant. I'll call it k. So if we calculate it first, then we can just plug and chug. I'll write out the discrete definition of variance and leave the continuous vision for the intrepid viewer. And if you're familiar with statistics, variance is standard deviation squared, but statisticians are stinky and cringe since they use real data. Expected value and variance are both fine and dandy, but how can we consider a more quote complex random event that depends on multiple component ones? Pretty simple. We just take them one at a time, assuming a previous one happened, weighted by that previous event's probability of occurrence. Here's an example that should help elucidate that. Say I have a coin, a six sided die labeled one through six, and a four sided die labeled one through four. And if I flip a heads on a coin, then I roll the six sided die. But if I flip a tails, I roll the four-sided die. Now, what's the probability I roll a one? I can write this out as the sum of two probabilities. The probability I roll a one on the six-sided die after flipping heads, and the probability I roll a one on the four-sided die after flipping tails. And then I can just plug in values and proceed. Furthermore, we can consider outcomes assuming a previous one. This is called conditioning and is defined as the probability of x X conditioned on Y equals the probability of the intersection of X and Y divided by the probability of Y, where the straight line shows that X is conditioned on Y, and the probability of the intersection of X and Y is defined as the probability of both X and Y happening. So given our previous example, we can calculate the likelihood of rolling a 1 conditioned on flipping a heads, which, yeah, 1 over 6. It's almost so obvious that it's almost not worth putting in work to show that. So here's a curveball. Given I roll a 1, what's the likelihood that I got a heads on the coin flip? But to calculate that, we're going to have to use Bayes' theorem, which is defined as the probability of A conditioned on B is equal to the probability of B conditioned on A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. This is extremely useful when we have incomplete information, which is what we're dealing with right now. So I'll use Bayes' theorem to find that probability. And it's just 2 over 5, which is honestly kind of mind-boggling that you can figure that out only given the observed end outcome, not even known which dice was rolled. Amazing. As I tried to state in my previous probability video, this is one of the greatest values of being well-versed in probability. The paradigms of expected value, variance, and Bayesian thinking allows one to make well-reasoned 
decisions with incomplete information. Just a great life skill overall. Now for some housekeeping. I'm still working on a standalone GDScript LSP and it's still handing me my ass. However, I'm getting better linker errors, which is a promising sign that I'm failing in the right direction. Also, demo day is coming up. I'm gonna try to review some demo day submissions, so those will be popping up in the feed. For those of you unfamiliar with demo day, it is a bi-monthly game jam submission where you can just show off whatever you're working on currently. It's hosted on itch.io. There are submissions for games from FPS games to driving games to deck builders, basically any kind of genre. So if you're interested in game dev or indie games, feel free to try out a few demos and leave your feedback. It's a great way to help out small, amateur, independent, and even usually individual game developers just like me. Finally, there's a 50% chance that I'll put out a video next month. I'm going on a hiking trip for a few weeks starting in late July, and I just might not have the time, what with cranking up my training and tying up all my work loose ends before that. And then for August, I don't know, I might actually do the backpacking video I threatened when I got back from Japan. It really depends on how much progress I make after I get back from touching grass. And that's it for this episode. As always, thank you for watching. I appreciate your time and I hope you have a good day. If you liked the video, please give it a like. And if you want to make sure I don't get mauled by a grizzly, please subscribe. I read all your comments. They're the best way to let me know I made a mistake in my math videos, much like this one. There's also a Discord server for the channel where you can talk about math, game dev, and baking. See the description for the link. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. All right, so again, another sourdough, and this one is, of course, I'm still doping with extra gluten, and I'm just, to this day, I'm doping my breads with extra gluten, not only sourdough, also focaccia, which, oh my god, also pizza dough, oh, let me tell you, the extra gluten, oh my god, it's great for pizza doughs, trust me, because that, you can take that up to like, well, Neapolitan style, or like a New York style pizza dough, of course, because that lets you go up to like, 90 90% hydration super easy without it becoming like a sticky mess it's great highly recommend but yeah as you can see sourdough this time um I'm, yeah i'm trying I've, i'm sticking with the like the the cross slash and i've just i've been trying out the cross slash for honestly for like i tried out for like half a year easily and uh supposedly like it helps uh for like bull shaped bread. It's better for bull, which is to say round shaped loaves, because it allows it to rise more uniformly than with a single slash or a main slash down the middle instead of a cross slash pattern. <clears throat> so that's what I'm doing here. Also, I didn't really, I usually tend to uh, either dust, dust off the flour on the outside, or I also spray down my loaf with a little spritz of water before I pop in the oven, that usually makes the exterior flour kind of, you know, uh, well, it doesn't stay white, but essentially it bakes. Uh, but here I didn't do that, so you still got that nice, you know, that classic sourdough aesthetic of you know, the white flour on the dough. And uh, if we took a look at the, oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, See, so yeah, I saved everything out of order, God. Uh, but if we take a look at the crumb, let me just, Zoom in. Oh, that's not how you zoom in with this application. Uh, but if we take a look at the crumb, um, it's pretty good. Pretty good. I also believe that this one was no need, and I don't. I don't have any knowledge about uh, the hydration, so I can't say. But it is the one thing I've noticed with the gluten. You get like crazy uniform uh, a crumb, which you know maybe you don't want that. Maybe if you're going for that more artisanal look. Where it's a more varied crumb structure, you know, the real big holes next to the kind of the smaller ones. I kind of like that one, you know. It seems it seems cooler to me than like the real uniform one. Like, admittedly, it's not that good for if you're like actually eating it, like a sandwich or you put like jam on it or butter. It's not that good because they're giant holes all the time. But it it felt, it looks, I think it looks prettier. It's a better look. It's not a better eating experience, though, which is the one one downside, I will say. So, again, if you want a more uniform crumb, of course, just add more gluten. Honestly, whenever you're making bread, it's like 
you know, you could just add more glue. It makes it a lot easier. Um, also, I think, and also, this might also be because of uh, the cross slash. Again, it's this is, of course, it's a more uniform rise because of the it's the more symmetrical vents for the steaming or the more radially symmetric, I guess, uh, vent for the steaming. And then, of course, I make two loves every time. So let's skip around a bit. Here we go. By Well, I have to skip around a bit. You, of course, just get in the proper order. And this is loaf number two. And of course, I, you know, I, I, I gave this one, one away or brought it to friends and we had it, I had it with some friends. So I didn't cut into it um, at home and take pictures. But here it is. Again, it looks real pretty. And this is another reason why I um, um, didn't uh, spritz the loaf, the loaves, I should say, beforehand. I have a new, I had this new, uh, this new double Dutch oven. I Meaning, use a Dutch oven, but you can use the top, you can use the lid and the pot as the cooking surface. And you're supposed to use the lid, or it's better, or I'm using it. So I'm trying it out. And I, you know, at first, uh, I couldn't, well, the first time I tried, um, uh, excuse me, the first time I, you know, sp sprayed down my loaf and then popped it on, oh my God, it stuck to the lid terribly, just terribly. So the first few loaves, uh, you won't see me spraying them down, but of course, after I built, built up a nice little shellac, a nice little seasoning of just, just that layer of just burnt carbon, you know, a nice nonstick layer of carbon from all the burnt flour on there uh, I start spraying it again and I don't have any sticking problems now so you know let that be a lesson to you just just let it burn <laughs> let it burn that's how it gets non-stick not for stainless steel oh my god don't do that for sting uh, on one of these days I'll make a video about how to properly maintain your pans and all your pots because I, I got everything I got well I got everything except non-stick because it just, oh my god, like it's great at first, but my god, after a few months, you gotta go. Oh, because at first, like two weeks, oh my god, whoo, nothing is sticking on those guys. But after like month three, like, oh, it's got it's covered. Well, this is also because I don't, you know, I, Mr., I'm gonna make a video how to maintain your cooking things doesn't maintain his non-sticks because I, I i blast those guys with max heat let me tell you i'm i'm treating them improperly <laughs> uh but yeah i got you know i got a car cabron carbon steel cabron steel uh, <laughs> uh uh cast iron and stainless steel and so you know my stainless steel well, so, you know, you know, I use them all depending on the thing, whatever I'm doing. Usually my daily drivers are my cabron steels and my uh, stainless steels. But, you know, the cast irons are in rotation. And, of course, I got some baking trays that are just easy peasy. So, yeah. Wow, weird weird digression, but damn, look at baking. Back to baking. And, of course, uh, but, yeah, I'm going to call it here. Uh, and I can, of course, use the classic sign-off guilt-free because there is of course yeast in bread in sourdough uh, i shouldn't just say in bed because of course there's flat bread you know you got your tortillas you get your nans etc etc uh but yes the yeast in the air is free so go out there and bake it's great it's delicious it's nutritious it's good for you it makes a great gift and it's a great way to show people that you appreciate them and i appreciate all of you Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.